Okay, now we're into biomechanics, which I found, like, really quite difficult, personally. Um, like, I've never been particularly good at physics or methods or anything like that. They've always been my worst units. Um, so I found this quite, like, a difficult area of study, and it feels like quite a lot of memorization. Um, it also feels kind of, like, like, you do a lot of content, but you don't get to, like, deeper layers, layers or levels of that content. Um, so it's kind of like you're learning a little bit about physics, but not enough to fully understand it. That's how I felt anyway. So I'm going to try and spend quite a bit of time on this area of study. Um, and I have got tons of definitions and stuff here, but I'm really going to focus more on lever systems, which I think is quite important. And also, um, moment of inertia, which I think is quite important as well, and will come up quite a lot. So, biomechanics involves studying living things from a mechanical perspective, including physics, using measurements of different forces, and improving human movement, okay? Uh, I've got like a disclosure thing here saying that you don't actually need to perform calculations in P exam because you don't get a calculator. You do have to know actually one formula and perform that calculation, which is uh, like your maximal heart rate, which is going to be 220 pig where your age. Um, yeah. Anyway, so biomechanics. So there are lots of definitions here. It's quite a heavy area of study. So I know lots of students will often be like trying to get ahead during the summer. I think it's quite useful. Um, but I would really make sure you enjoy your summer first. But if there's anything I would recommend trying to like get a good solid understanding of, it's biomechanics. So try and do that early so that you can grasp it well by the time it comes around to learning it at school because it's just a very heavy area of study, I find. Okay, so Firstly, forces. We have to understand what a force is, which is when one object acts on another object. And an easy way to think about it is a push or a pull force. Forces are measured in newtons, also written as m. Forces will generally change the motion of an object, either speeding it up, slowing it down, or changing its direction. I don't know why newtons is what it is. Uh, mass and weight. So this is also another important point. Mass is measured in kilograms. So this isn't my mass personally, but you might have a body mass of about 65 kilograms, okay? Weight, on the other hand, like when you get on the scale, you often say, I weigh this. That's actually wrong, so I'm not really sure why it's stuck around for so long. But weight is the force acting on object due to gravity. Maybe because our gravity on Earth is, you know, even then it should be measured in newtons, not kilograms. So weight is the force acting on object due to gravity. So for example... Weight is equal to mass times gravity. So it's measured in newtons. So when you get on the scale and you like read your weight, it should be like newtons, like it shouldn't be kilograms. But I've never seen a scale that says you are 70 newtons or whatever, you know? Um, so yeah, weight is equal to mass times the acceleration of gravity. Because we're on Earth, the acceleration of gravity is like 9.8 meters per second squared, right? But if you're on Mars or the moon or literally anywhere else in the universe, the gravity acting on you is going to be different. As a result, your weight will be different. However, your mass will always stay the same. It's quite a contentious point. This isn't really something that comes up in the exam very much at all, but it is good to understand. Okay, this one does though. These three laws of motion are very important and they do come up quite often, so I would highly recommend knowing them. So Newton's first law of motion is also known as the law of inertia. If you're asked to define Newton's first law, you can't just write the law of inertia, though. You have to actually explain the whole thing. So, know something, like, along these lines. So, an object at rest or in motion will remain at rest or in motion unless acted upon by an external unbalanced force. Um, I know my definition's a bit different to that one there, just a tiny bit, but whatever you memorize, make sure it's something along those lines, okay? And that you write out the whole thing, not just the law of inertia. Newton's second law of motion is pretty much force equals mass times acceleration. So you can write down F equals MA, but what you then need to do is actually write it out in words. So Newton's second law of motion states that the force of an object is equal to its mass times by or multiplied by its acceleration. What this means is that something which has a bigger mass will require more force in order to accelerate it. Okay, because you can actually rearrange this formula. Um, I like don't do any math anymore. So let's see if I can force equals mass times acceleration. Then A. You want to get A by itself. You can get A is equal to whatever the number is. So 
something like that. Anyway, um, because so that's right. Anyway, what you do is you do re rearrange that formula and you get um, acceleration by itself, okay? Um, and as a result of this, you can restate that formula. So the more force an object has, the more, sorry, the more mass an object has, the more force is required to accelerate. Something like that. Um, but yeah, really just knowing F equals ma is your starting point for this second law of motion. Newton's third law of um, motion is like the law of action reaction, but you do have to say the whole thing again. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So for example here, when you hit a tennis ball with a racket, your racket hits the ball. You can see that ball go flying. And the ball will also actually have an equal reaction on the racket. But because the ball is so much smaller than the racket, it's got much less force, it's it's kind of hard to see, okay? So it's just about understanding that. So for example, when you jump on Earth, you exert a force on the Earth, and the Earth also exerts a force on you. So it's, it's something that's kind of complex to see. A good example there is when you are on a boat, like if you've ever been rowing and you've jumped off the boat and you can see the boat go backwards and you go forwards. So that's the law of action reaction. So for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. You can kind of go opposite ways. Okay, this is a very dense slide. Um, I know it looks a bit insane, like very heavy, but it's gonna be very useful. So I have written quite a lot here because it will be quite helpful for you later on. So if you wanna just save the slide, you can download these slides later. Um, but yeah, it, it's quite a lot. So I'll try and do my best to kind of make it as easy to understand as possible um, and just kind of take out the most important bits and kind of convey them to you. So what is inertia? It's the tendency for an object to resist a change to its state of motion. So if an object is traveling, like a truck is traveling at 100 um, kilometers an hour on the freeway, it wants to keep moving in that direction, okay? especially if it's got quite high mass. So something which try and like crashes into the truck, it won't have like huge, it might have a huge effect, but it, it shouldn't have as much an effect as another truck, which is more, like it's got a higher mass, it has higher inertia. So this truck wants to continue in that kind of direction at that kind of speed. Momentum is the amount of motion that a moving object has. It's a bit hard to understand. Like you don't need to know too much about it, but having this kind of basic understanding is really good. What you do want to know though is momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So P is equal to mv. This is a really important formula to know. P equals mv. So you do want to know that for later. Momentum is measured in kilograms in per meter squared. Okay. So imagine that two objects with the same velocity. The one with the greater mass will have the most momentum. And it's the same as the object with two mass. The one with the greatest velocity will have the most momentum because of this formula. Okay, conservation momentum. So in an isolated collision, momentum will always be conserved, which means the total net momentum before the collision is equal to the total net momentum after the collision. I hope you have some pictures described. Yeah, I do. Okay, this is a really good diagram picture describing it. So just kind of um, explaining the conservation of momentum here. So we can see the guy on the left has a momentum of 100 kilograms in meters per second, whereas the guy on the right has 80. Who has the most momentum here? The guy on the left. However, this entire system has like 180 kilograms per meter second momentum. Um, so we need to conserve that. So the net momentum here will be 100 take away 80, because they're kind of colliding with each other. Um, because this guy is going, like if they're going in different directions, they're going to continue on in the direction that the guy with the most momentum actually has. So this guy has 100 kilograms meter second of momentum going in the right hand direction whereas this guy's going the left hand direction because he has more momentum than this other guy we're going to actually subtract from momentum 100 take 80 and that leaves us with 20 which means we're going to have 20 kilograms per second momentum traveling in the right hand direction so when they collide they're actually going to continue moving in this right hand direction because this guy has more momentum so remember that um uh, it's P equals mv. Let me check that. Yep, momentum is mass times velocity. So if they both weigh the same, whoever has the most velocity will actually have the most momentum. So if you are coming up against someone who's much bigger than you, perhaps, if you can kind of increase your velocity and speed up a bit, 
you could probably try and gain more momentum, which means that when you do collide, you'll continue traveling in your direction as opposed to the direction of your opponent, okay? Um, something else to note is the summation of momentum. So this refers to an object being struck with maximal velocity. So when the object is to hit it as, oh sorry, when the object, like the, the goal, is to hit it as far as possible. So momentum is generated through the body in a sequential fashion, beginning with body parts closest to the center of gravity, such as the chest and torso, transit to the parts of the body or further away. So going through the arms, forearms, wrists, fingertips, etc. Um, impulse is the change in momentum of an object. So in order to change momentum, a force needs to be applied to an object over a period of time. So impulse is equal to force times time. So imagine when you're catching a ball that is coming at you quite quickly. When you catch it, you like move your hands back to try and cushion the ball. Okay, so that moving the, your hands back is actually increasing the time of which you're letting the force of the ball apply to your hands. <coughs> um, because you're spreading that force over a great amount of time, it means that there is less force kind of applied on your hands in an instant, which kind of decreases the risk of injury. Okay, so. Yeah, increasing the time of which you apply the force can actually decrease the force of the ball or the object on your, your body and therefore decrease the risk of injury. Another thing you can consider in this example is jumping off a wall. Um, so when you jump off a wall, you might be taught to like end up in like a, what do they call it? They call it the motorbike pose or something like that. Like you bend your knees and kind of cushion the blow of the force. So this kind of like cushioning act is also increasing the time over which that force is applied and as a result you can actually reduce the risk of injury uh, because you are decreasing that force. So it's actually quite useful in real life, which is good to know. Okay, um, we've already looked at linear motion, which those three laws, now we're looking at angular motion. And they're pretty much very similar, but we have swapped out a few words. So we do insert the word angular momentum to remain constant was acted upon by an external torque. So torque just kind of replaces force. And it's kind of like a rotational force. Newton's second law of uh, motion, um, oh sorry, of angular motion is sort of similar, so it's, but it's, it's more about using this formula um, and talking about moment of inertia. So torque applied to an object will cause a change in the angular motion of the object that's proportional to the size of the torque and inversely proportional to the moment of inertia the object has. So moment of inertia is the tendency of an object to resist changes to its rotation. So moment of inertia is equal to mass times radius squared. Um, we will look at this formula in a bit more detail very shortly, because I do think it's quite useful. Hopefully I do have an example now. So an object whose mass is close to the center will be much easier to rotate. Um, this is quite like a, a short sentence. It looks a bit like a throwaway line, but it's quite important because it might spend a few minutes on this. So an object whose mass is close to the center will be much easier to rotate because it has a lower moment of inertia than an object whose mass is spread far away from the center. So pretty much a small stick is easier to rotate than a big stick, okay? So junior players often use smaller equipment because they're easy to rotate because they've got a lower moment of inertia because their mass is closer to the center, therefore they're easy to rotate, than a bigger object which has a mass which is further away from the center and has a higher moment of inertia. Okay, <clears throat> third law of motion. For every torque, there's an equal and opposite torque. Pretty much just replace force with torque, which is like the angular force, or rotational force. Okay, this slide is really important, you guys. So I would actually bookmark this slide here. This comes up quite frequently on exams and stacks. I would actually expect it to come up again, um, just because it is a very common question example scenario. So, angular momentum is the amount of angular motion that an object has. It is always conserved. Here is a formula, okay? Angular momentum is equal to moment of inertia times angular velocity. I'm actually going to annotate the slide, and I would recommend you guys, like, take some notes here, because this is something very important. Um, so, moment of inertia. Moment of inertia also has its own formula. So moment of inertia is equal to mass times, so how to like draw on my laptop, radius squared, okay, mass times radius squared. 
the moment of inertia is equal to mass times radius squared. It's also really important to understand these concepts of conservation because um, I didn't really think I understood this well enough in high school and I feel like I do now. So I'm just going to try and make sure that you guys understand this as well. So you know how at the start I said there were going to be some areas which I would skip and some areas which I'd try and spend quite a bit of time on. This is going to be an area that I spend a lot of time on because I think this is quite a high yield area. So I think this is like the time to like pay attention here. Like if you take anything away from this, I think this would be a really good thing to take away from this lecture. Okay, so angular momentum is the amount of angular motion that an object has. Here is our formula for angular momentum. You must memorize this. Angular momentum is equal to moment of inertia times by angular velocity. Moment of inertia is equal to mass times radius squared. Angular momentum is conserved while an object is in flight. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's just work through this formula first. Angular momentum is always conserved. So let's highlight this. It's always conserved. I'm just gonna turn that on. What this means is it's kind of like a seesaw. So angular momentum is a seesaw. If one thing goes up, the other thing must go down in order to balance it out and kind of level it out and get it back to like that happy medium there. Okay? Which means that if our moment of inertia increases, our angular velocity must decrease. It's like a set of weights, okay? You add more weights on one side, the other side will go up. That's what this conservation principle kind of means, okay? So, I don't know why we want to improve our moment of inertia, but people generally want to increase the angular velocity because it means they will be faster, okay? So if we want to increase our angular velocity, what we can do is kind of manipulate this formula. So we can actually, in order to increase angular velocity, we can try and decrease moment of inertia, which actually has some real world benefits. So for example, if you are a diver jumping off a diving board at the pool, and you do somersaults, okay? You want to do like five somersaults to jump off that board, okay? You need to be pretty fast for that. You need to have a high angular velocity, okay? In order to have a high angular velocity, you want to have this like a low moment of inertia. <clears throat> so if we address this question here, why does a diver go into the tuck position to perform a triple somersault? So angular momentum is conserved while an object is in flight. We know that angular momentum is conserved, which means that one thing goes up, or one component goes up, the other must go down. This means that when a diver goes into tuck position, the moment of inertia is decreased. Because their mass is, okay, all of that doesn't really make enough sense for us yet. What's really important is that we actually pull this formula apart. And we actually kind of separate it into its, like, core components. So, we've got moment of inertia and angular velocity. Our formula for moment of inertia is equal to mass times radius squared, okay? We can increase our mass. We can increase our radius. If we increase this, though... This means that our angular velocity would decrease. So if you are heavier, or you have more mass, or you put on an ankle weight or something, <coughs> your mass would be more. If your mass is more, your angular velocity would be less. If you think of someone like jumping into a pool and doing like a big belly flop as well. Actually, we'll move on to that concept in a second. Radius. So if I crouch up small, my radius is really small. If I stretch out wide, my radius is wide. So if you imagine someone jumping to the pool and they're belly flopping, and they've like spread out their arms, they're just like diving and just flopping into the pool, you can kind of almost see that happening in slow motion. Like it kind of feels like they are moving slower. Whereas someone who does like a graceful little dive, they're very, you know, kept their body very like closed in together and like aerodynamically like thin like that. Like their body is just a very thin needle going into the water. It feels like they're going quite fast and like the reason it feels like that is because it, it literally is feeling a bit slower or heavier right they've got more angular velocity when they crouch up smaller as compared to when they like flop in okay okay so i feel like i've been talking for like five minutes and it's very confusing but this is going to make sense in a second so let's keep going through this the air is so dry today okay let's start again or just like recap what we know so far Angular momentum is conserved, which means its core components, moment of inertia and angular velocity must be kind of balanced as a seesaw. So if moment of inertia goes up, angular velocity goes down. 
What's quite useful to us is that if we are a diver, we can actually increase our angular velocity. This is useful because it means that we can actually fit in more somersaults when we're diving. So what we want to do is increase our angular velocity. And we know that to increase this, we must decrease our moment of inertia. How can we decrease our moment of inertia? Well, we can actually decrease our moment of inertia by decreasing our mass or decreasing our radius. Just like snapping your fingers and decreasing your mass is quite difficult unless you take off like an ankle weight or something like that. So that's usually quite out of the question for something instantaneous. But what we can do is we can make our radius really small. So if we curl up really small, our mass will remain the same. Our radius will actually decrease. And this means that overall our moment of inertia will decrease. Because this is not conserved. This can just go down depending on its core components. <clears throat> if our moment of inertia is decreased, this means our angular velocity increases. Okay, so we actually have a faster velocity. Which means we can actually like get in more somersaults before we hit the water. So that's quite useful to people who do diving, I guess. So overall, we can actually manipulate our moment of inertia in order to influence our angular momentum and attain a higher or lower velocity, depending on our radius. And our radius is really like, how wide is our body at this present moment? Or how like wide is it now? And comparing that. I know that was a very convoluted explanation. Please let me know in the chat if that did make sense. Um, try and go back and reread this. Maybe take a photo of my screen now. You can go back and rewatch this recording later. But really try and get a grasp on this concept, okay? Because it is quite useful. You can see here that because this person has like quite a long radius, they're actually quite slow. Whereas this person's got a very small radius. Sorry, I don't know why diameter the radius would just be one. Whereas this person has a very small radius, they're actually a lot faster. They've got a faster angular velocity. Okay, so we're about more than an hour in now. But hopefully that makes sense. Please let me know if you want a bit more clarification. I can try and write it out in the chat. But yeah, try and go back and rewatch this and try and like understand it and break it up into these core components because this is a very important part of the study design and it's quite a common thing which is asked by the examiners. Okay, we might just gloss through quite a bit of this because you will cover this. It isn't too hard to understand. If you're doing methods or any kind of math, you might actually cover it there too. It's quite simplistic. But ultimately, the formula for speed is distance over time. The formula for velocity is displacement over time. Velocity is a vector, which means it has a direction. So, for example, 10 meters per second north. Um, what is displacement? If you have like a 400 meter running track, and you start here, and you do one lap, your distance is going to be 400 meters. But your displacement is pretty much drawing a straight line from your start and end point. And if your start and end point are the same, you haven't moved anywhere, according to displacement. Okay, so displacement is zero. That's all displacement is. Really, well, as far as we need to know from here anyway. Um, acceleration is a change in velocity over a period of time, so change in velocity over change in time. Zero acceleration does not mean no movement. So if we think about this concept, this is also something to note. If our acceleration is zero, it simply means we can either be not moving or we've actually just kept at a constant pace. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so just a bit more on this, like, angular motion. If I have a tennis ball, which I did have a minute ago, anyway, um, if I have a tennis ball, I'll just use this lip balm. Um, so I have a tennis ball. If I hit it through the middle, it's going to like just react quite well. It's going to go quite solid through the air. Um, but if I hit it off the side, it kind of spins off kilter. Like it's kind of got a wild spin to it. And this is about lever arm and torque. So the lever arm is like the distance where the force is applied. So where the force is applied, that distance to the center of gravity. Okay, so from the center of gravity where the force is applied, that's the lever arm. So the greater the lever arm, the more wildly that ball will spin. Okay, which means the greater the torque or the greater the rotation of the ball. So it has like a bigger rotation or a wilder spin. Okay. Heavy, slide. It's very similar to what we discussed before. Um, it's more about distance and displacement. So if you're a gymnast and you're doing two full rotations around a bar, one rotation is 360 degrees, two of them is another 360 degrees, which equals 720 degrees. But your displacement, because you start and end at the same spot, will be zero. Okay. Um, we've got a few more formulas here. So linear velocity is equal to angular velocity times radius of rotation. <coughs> Okay, so imagine a golfer hitting a ball. 
So to increase the linear velocity of the ball, we could increase the radius of rotation. The radius of rotation is like the size of the clock, how long that golf club is. So if the golf club is only that much, whereas the golf club is this much, you can kind of guess which one has a larger like, uh, radius of rotation, which will be the bigger one, right? So the higher the radius of rotation, the higher the linear velocity which can be achieved. So a bigger club or a longer club will mean that you could probably attain more linear velocity. But one thing to note is that a bigger club, even though it may give you more linear velocity, which means more distance pretty much, um, it can be a bit heavier, so you might need more force applied in order to actually attain that distance. And this explains why drivers are longer than irons, so for existence, for existence. For example, when you want to hit off the tee in golf, um, you might get a bigger club, like a driver, in order to try and get it as close as you can to the green, right? And once you're there, you can use like a putter or something, maybe, or an iron if you're not very far. Okay, angular acceleration works in a similar way as linear acceleration. We're not going to spend too much time on that. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time on this slide. It's quite a quick um, thing to discuss, I guess. So any object that is thrown or stuck into the air is known as a projectile. It has that vertical component, which is how high it goes, and a horizontal component, which is how far it goes. So vertical, um, theoretically, it would continue going up if we didn't have gravity, but we do have gravity. So gravity will like accelerate it at 9.8 meters per second um, towards the ground. Um, the horizontal component affects how far the ball travels with the feet in the ground. This is usually affected by air resistance. If we didn't have air resistance, typically horizontal velocity would remain continuous. Um, yeah. So factors that affect projectile motion include angle of release, speed of release, and height of release. So angle of release, um, so typically 45 degrees is like our optimal to get like a really far horizontal distance. Speed of release, a greater speed of release means we've got more horizontal and vertical component. And then we've got our height of release. And this is really something which can be adjusted um, depending on where you want the ball to go. So if we are just trying to go like a great horizontal distance, we want our height of release to just be zero really. Um, kind of think about how like when you're standing as well. So if you're like, it wouldn't be zero. It might be like however tall you are, like one point three meters maybe if that's where your arms are. So that's where height of release is. If you want to get it to go the same spot, some on the same height over there, catching at the same height. If you're launching projector from above where it will land, you actually want an angle which is less than forty five degrees. Whereas if you're trying to throw up, you need more of an angle. So you actually need to add more. So that 45 degrees, okay? So if you've got to throw high, you've got to throw it up. I won't spend too much time on this. I really, just the major thing I wanted to cover was that diving concept. So hopefully that makes sense. And potentially levers, if we can get a slide on levers, which we do, which is good. So I'm going to cover levers and that one slide on diving in quite a bit of depth. Um, <clears throat> that's the main thing I want you guys to take away from biomechanics. I feel like it's the biggest concepts which come up for the more relevant, highest yield type stuff. So, yeah. Okay, what is a lever? It's a rigid bar that rotates around an axis in order to exert a force on another object. All levers consist of an axis, force, and resistance. Your teacher may use different words. Um, I actually can't remember what the other words are because I never use them. I think these ones are quite useful and they work with my mnemonics too. So, yeah. We've got three types of levers, first, second, and third class levers. Okay, good. I have a few slides on this. So... We actually have to memorize the orderings of levers, so I'm going to go through my little example for that. But first, just going to discuss the parts of levers. We've got fulcrum, loader, effort, but I say axis, resistance, force. So that's the axis, this is the resistance, and there's the force. So the resistance is like a heavy load, or like the force that your arms push down on against. Here are three types of levers. So you do have to memorize the structures of the levers and their orderings of the axis, force, and resistance. And so I have a mnemonic for this. I actually sometimes get students message me like years later and they tell me that mnemonic actually really helped you. So if you think this will help you out, please let me know in the chat. It'd be really good. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a strange mnemonic, but it has helped me and quite a few other people too. So let me know. Okay, so three types of levers, axis, resistance, force, kind of shuffled around for each of these lever types. So with the first class lever, we've got the axis here. We've got the resistance and the force. It can also be kind of the opposite way, so axis with resistance and force on the other side, but either way it's that same 
building. Then we've got second class labor and third class labor, where those are kind of shuffled around. Okay, um, I work as like a visual learner. Like I find it hard to listen to lectures, which are just speaking for a long period of time. I need drawings and diagrams and like imagery to help me remember stuff. <coughs> so this is how I remember levers. So I always think of like an athletics field. I actually think of the Box Hill one. I'm not sure if that's still there, but I used to like do my athletics days and stuff there. So I think of the Box Hill like athletics ground. Um, I think it has a red track. I think that's Box Hill. Anyway, so I think of an athletics field, right? We've got three people running in a 400 meter race. So they're going around that track. The whole field's empty except for these three people, okay? They're running their race. The person in first place at the moment, they um, are far ahead of everyone else. They are far ahead of everybody else, okay? I know that's not great English, but they are far ahead. That's the person in first place. They're just like chilling. They are going to win this race and they know it. They are far ahead. The person in second place is kind of going through it. They're actually sprinting quite a bit, but this is because they've got a dog chasing after them. And that dog is like nipping at their ankles going, arf, arf, arf. You know, in like cartoons um, or comic books and stuff where the dog says arf. So the person in second place is running. They've got a dog yapping at their ankles, trying to bite their ankles yelling, arf. So first place, far ahead. Second place, quite a bit behind them, but being chased by a dog yelling, arf. And third place has practically given up. They know they're going to finish after everybody else. They're going to finish after everybody else. Okay. So, first place far ahead. Second place, arf. Third place, after. And this is your ordering of the levers. So, first class lever, second class lever, and third class lever. So, first class lever, you've always got the axis in the middle with force and resistance on either side. You can also write it as resistance, axis, and force. It doesn't matter which way. You can, like, flip it around. But as long as your middle is the same. So, keep your middle there. Second place, you've got axis and force on either side of resistance. So, once again, you can write it the other way. So, just make sure you keep the middle never the same. And third place, you've got uh, AFR or RFA. I find this quite useful. Um... Because writing it out also is kind of like a, not a cheat, because you're allowed to do this, but it kind of feels like you're cheating, because it's like you've got a full diagram in front of you, which all you've done is just like remember this little scenario. So first place far ahead, second place R with the dog yapping at the heels, and third place after everybody else. Okay, so levers have a thing. If I go to this, like, you just covered these three slides in like, in like a minute. Um... <clears throat> um, I'm not sure if I want to discuss the rest of the lever stuff, but I will give you a bit more example here. Um, force arm, other resistance arm. Okay, so if a lever's force arm is greater than its resistance arm, so for example, if a force arm, okay, so first of all, let me talk to you about what a force arm is. This is the distance from the force to the axis. So you can see for this one, the second class lever, you've got quite a big force arm. It's actually bigger than the resistance arm because the resistance is shorter there. <clears throat> okay, whereas if the resistance arm is greater, this is the opposite, the resistance arm is greater for the third class lever, whereas the first class lever can be quite variable because that force can be very far away from the axis and then you sort of have to shift. So we don't, we kind of ignore the first class lever a bit in PE, um, but the force arm and resistance arm length can have wider applications for the sport. So if the force arm is greater than the resistance arm, as is the case in the second class lever, then we can actually lift quite a heavy force with relatively little, um, like, or we can lift a heavy resistance, I guess, or like amount of weight with relatively little force applied. And so <clears throat> a very common example of this is a wheelbarrow. You can lift quite a large like amount of rocks and things with little like, force required. Or another example is when you can lift your heels up, heel raises, or you stand on tiptoe. If you're just sitting down, 
well, you should be standing up actually, and you stand on your tiptoes, you're actually lifting like the entire weight of your body on your toes, right? That's it's quite a lot of weight. Like I don't even know if I can lift my entire body weight. I can't do a pull up or anything. Um, but just by standing on tiptoes, you can do that. <clears throat> so that's the example of the stacking class labor in motion, which is why I say imagine that dog yapping at your heels, because then you have an example. So a dog yapping at your heels, an example of this is a heel raise or a tiptoe stand. You're actually applying the stacking class lever. Um, <clears throat> a third class lever, while it doesn't actually help us lift any um, like weight at all really, it does allow us to attain a wide range of motion. I guess this wide range of motion allows us to achieve a higher linear velocity um, or like hit something further away. So <clears throat> this is the most common sporting example. Often you'll be asked to identify the type of lever used in a particular scenario, and I would, like, in your shoes, just pick third class lever, typically, if it's trying to hit something. I was trying to imagine the wide range of motion. Um, so, for example, if someone's kicking, you can kind of imagine the arch of their foot, like their leg swinging. Or if someone's, like, hitting something, like a baseball and they're hitting a, a ball, you can imagine that swinging motion. Or if they're, you know, cricket or something like that. If you can kind of imagine that swinging motion, and you're trying to hit something or kick something as far as possible, it's going to be a third class lever, okay? So kicking something is a third class lever. Another example is like a bicep pull. You've got that like swinging motion of your arm, which is how I also remember third class lever. Um, or like that bicep curl is an example of a third class lever. So yeah, it's really important that you have those examples. Um, I think an example of first class lever is like nodding your head, um, but we don't really use that very much. Yeah, so nodding your head or like a head neck area is an example of third class lever, first class lever, but we don't use that very much in PA. Whereas the second class levers are quite important. So heel raises or tiptoes, really good because it's got a mechanical advantage. So the mechanical advantage is this formula. When the force arm is greater than the resistance arm, we have a mechanical advantage, as is seen in the second class lever, because we can actually lift quite a heavy weight relatively easily. Whereas in the case of the third class lever, the resistance arm is longer, than the force arm, which means we actually have a mechanical disadvantage according to the fractions, which might sound like a bad thing, but it's actually very useful for achieving a wide range of motion. Um, greater range of motion and speed of motion. Okay, so they have a mechanical disadvantage um, or no mechanical advantage, but they can help you achieve a wide range of motion. Okay, um, a few more definitions here, just about equilibrium, balance, and stability. They are all written down here, so I probably won't spend much time on them, as I'd like to move on to energy systems, which is quite a big area of study. Once again, center of gravity. Um, these are quite straightforward. I think I do have some pictures. So, not amazing pictures, but just kind of identifying, well, actually, quite a good one, um, what each of these things mean. So just trying to get an understanding of these definitions. It's quite good. But I think we only have like 45 minutes left, so I want to move on. Um, <clears throat> so don't panic. Practice using questions as much as possible. Do the practice VCAR exams. Remember, calculations aren't really necessary, but you do need to like have a good understanding of them. 